So we are making our way through the book of Galatians, and Lord willing, we will, we will progress through chapter 1 and enter chapter 2. So chapter 1, you know, Paul kind of, we kind of get the lay of the land, we understand what's going on. There are false teachers at Colossae, which is, right, the location, which is in southwest Asia and Turkey today, near Laodicea. And, um, and we know that they're causing issues, but Paul really hasn't said exactly what those are. And yet he was bothered enough to write something quick, right? Because it's four chapters. We're pretty sure he's in prison when he's writing this based on what he says. And, uh, and Paul does a number of kind of rhetorical things where he'll say something and then he'll take a little interlude or a little, he'll, he'll kind of, uh, what do you call it when you go off the beaten track or you kind of take a diversion and then you go back. And so he did that with a hymnic interlude last week, right? So he, he you know, it would have been a hymn in his day, though it doesn't match the criteria for a hymn for us. Because for, for us, hymns have a specific meter and a kind of a rhyme pattern. And that's not the case in the original Greek. And then he, after that, he goes back to what he said right before the hymnic interlude for a few verses and, right? And then, uh, and then he, and he's going to do the same thing today. He's going to say a little blurb and then bloop, off into another interlude, but this one is not a hymn. It doesn't have a particular format, okay? So it's, it's prose, okay? And that's kind of where we find ourselves today, okay? So we can look at the intro, okay? So right at the bottom of the intro and review section, right? What is Paul doing? Okay, we'll find out today that what he, what he will cover will affirm his authority. In other words, why is he worth listening to? Because he's bringing the real deal, which implies what? What does this imply about the, wait a minute. What does this imply about the false teachers? That they're not bringing the real deal, okay? So in a sense, when he's, when he's uh, legitimating himself like this, he's really saying, I'm bringing the goods. Okay, and then he's using the challenges he faced as an apostle as an example of continuing in the faith, faith steadfast and sure. And that's what he encouraged them to do earlier in Colossians chapter 1. Okay, so with that, let's turn to verse 24. Okay, now this is Paul speaking. So, this diversion, he's really talking about himself, but not in a but not for some self-aggrandizement or anything like that, okay? Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Okay, what does he mean by for your sake? He's enduring suffering for what reason? For their benefit, right? Because God's using him to what? As a proclaimer of the gospel, to bring them his word. Okay, so he sees even though he's suffering, it serves a purpose. It's just not suffering in vain. There's only one lesson left, Nancy. You'll have to scarf that one up there. Okay, you'll have to share with hubby. Oh, well, so I know, but Mike has really good eagle eyes and he could read the printed text 30 feet away, so, you know, he's good. He doesn't even need glasses. Those are fake. He just wears that so he looks smart. Okay. Here we go. Oh boy, I need to go back to comedy school. I'm really bad. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. Okay, he just dropped a bomb here. He's suffering in the flesh and what is he doing? I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? So... That's, where is he going with this? What does he mean by that? And so this is one of those things where if we just take this one verse and don't look at anything else Paul wrote in Colossians, we could come up with several things, all of which will be wrong probably except for one. Okay? So what do we know what he doesn't mean when he says, at least as this translation reads, he is what? 
He is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And that's a good translation. There's nothing wrong with it. So, so we have something called an excursus on page one. Filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. What Paul isn't saying is that Christ's atonement for our salvation is incomplete. We could easily get that from this text. He could be saying that, but he's not. He's saying something else. Now, how do we know that? Well, because if we look at Colossians, the rest of Colossians, all the way through, not including any other texts, um, this contradicts what he wrote elsewhere, that Christ's atonement is complete, is enough for us. And we've already seen that earlier in Colossians. And so I have some references in the parentheses there. So he doesn't mean that. Otherwise, he would be like the Alzheimer's king. He just forgot what he just wrote. Okay? Paul wasn't that old. People may have thought that about the Apostle John, but not about Paul. You know, if you read Revelation, right? So, uh, so these afflictions, afflictions are referring not to Christ on the cross, but the afflictions of Christ in his body, the church. Do you see where Paul kind of makes that flip there? Let's look again at verse 24, okay? So, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. So, his body, whose body? Christ's body, see? So, right, Christ is the head and we are the members, okay? So that's what, he, that's what he's talking about there. Okay? And Revelation touches on this in passing, Revelation 6. We know this passage because we hear it, I don't know, every, every so often. But let's, let's review it. This is from Revelation chapter 6. When he, the Lamb, that's metaphorical language referring to Jesus. Okay? Okay. When he, the Lamb, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain, for the word of God and for the witnesses, for the witness they had borne. In other words, they were martyred for the faith because they were Christians. Okay? They cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? These are the saints in heaven who are praying. Okay? So even though they're not suffering anguish and suffering and so on and so forth, they still know enough to pray for us and yet they're not they're not what? Saddened by it as we understand it. Then they were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. See? So this is referring to those who had been martyred and who will be martyred. Okay? And so... Right. In other words, what? Right. In other words, what? So that, so that all of this will not be for nothing. And they know it won't. Right? But this is, this is for what? For God to make right what happened to the saints who were martyred. Okay? And that takes place on the last day. Right? Right? Lamb, goats, Christ is, is judging everyone. Th though he's doing so with the Father's authority. Okay, so, so, and so, in other words, so Revelation chapter six is really talking about what? The suffering involved of being a Christian. And then, uh, and then if, we, if we look and John is seeing a vision and he, and he sees those coming out of the great tribulation. Now that's a, that's, that's a, a continuing present tense in the Greek. So it's not as if the Great Tribulation is a specific time in history. The Great Tribulation is the time every Christian experiences while living in this fallen world. Okay? So let's, let's, let's turn the page on page two. So what is lacking, needing to be filled up, refers to the tribulations Christians face in this fallen world as they deal with the domain of darkness. And that's what Paul calls living in this fallen world. He calls it the dominion or domain of darkness, right? Luther kind of refers to that in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress, right? 
So talking about that this is really the devil's domain. And yet, he still is defeated in Christ. Okay? Well, Christians, okay, so when we're a Christian, we just don't, oh yeah, I know about Jesus. And Jesus isn't only some abstract thing in some place called heaven. We're actually united to him. He is in us. We are in him. I mean, so, so think about what happens in baptism. Not just that we're given birth, and that communion is holy food, right? Everyone understands being born. And if you give birth to a child, if you don't feed and feed the child, the child dies. So that's a no-brainer concerning the Christian faith. We're given new birth through baptism, and holy communion is spiritual feeding. Not the only way that we're fed, but we can get that easily, okay? Um, and yet what? Um, uh, and yet, when we're baptized, into whom are we baptized? Well, yes, the triune God, but in this case, we want to we focus on Jesus. We're baptized into Jesus and in the Lord's Supper. So, baptism goes one way, us into Jesus, and communion is the other way, Jesus into us. So, you know, it's kind of like, we're with Jesus coming and going. Okay? So, we're united to him, which means What? When we suffer, we're united to him. We're joined to him. He's joined to us. So when we suffer, we are not suffering alone. Yes. Well, so, Jerry, you're asking, is a, ba a baptism isn't complete unless it's done in the triune name of the triune God? I'm going to say yes, but let's qualify that. Because if it's not done in the name of the triune God, it isn't a real baptism. It's not a Christian baptism. Because it's done in some way other than by the command and mandate of Christ. Christ says, baptize into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? And it has to be the real Father, the real Son, the real Holy Spirit. Not, oh yeah, but I think Jesus was actually a snail who ate grass on the ground. Oh, well, okay, if you're baptized in the name of snail Jesus, that's not a Christian baptism, even though you use the name Jesus. See, And so that way, even the, so we can refer to a Mormon baptism. They use the same words, but in Mormonism, or la, if, you're Latter -day, if you're part of the Latter-day Saint Church, Jesus is Lucifer's brother. What? See, so even though they use the same words, it's not a Christian baptism. And so that's the reason why every Christian church will say that was not a Christian baptism and you will not be re-baptized, but be baptized properly. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we're joined to Christ, which means we are not suffering alone because we're with Christ and he is with us. And also from what we read in Revelation, Who's praying for us? The saints in heaven, as well as the saints on earth, right? So that also provides a level of comfort. So through this, that is, the sufferings we experience, we can better sense the mercy Jesus showed for us and others in his suffering for our salvation. In other words, it's just not useless. God will take suffering, which is a result of this fallen world, and turn it for the good. He did that with Jesus' death, right? I mean, why was Jesus crucified? Oh, was God's plan to save us? Yes. But everybody who acted and took, uh, uh, acted in such a way so Christ was crucified, acted according to his own interests and sinfulness. No one was an automaton. Everyone did what he, he wanted according to whatever drove him, Christ ends up being killed, and how did God use that for our salvation? So that's how we know that the stuff that we go through, God's going to use it in some way, even though we can't comprehend how. Okay? That's where faith is involved. Okay? So uh, the first bullets on page two, like Jesus is suffering, our suffering is also the result of sin, of living in a fallen world. So there's a connectedness. Bullet number two, unlike, or we can go, however, unlike his suffering, 
Ours is not salvific, not salvation causing, since we're part of the problem, part of the dark domain of this sinful world. Yet, as the sufferings of the Messiah are overflowing into us, so also are we overflowing in comfort through the Messiah. That's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. That's, so our unitedness is not some mere abstract thing, right? Christ's unity with us is something real. And that's, you know, that, that's why you have all these admonitions about how could, you do, how could you bring these divisions to the Lord's Supper because Jesus isn't divided, so on and so forth. Okay? So when did Jesus' sufferings on the cross take place? Well, it took place before he rose from the dead, right? So we're going to follow that one through. So God uses this same Jesus sanctified pattern to take our sufferings for others to help prepare us for the resurrection to come. Okay? So that's why it's kind of good to know the content of the faith and to kind of know what's going on. All this stuff is happening, but it's kind of good if you know it. Right? Because that way at least you could understand it in your brain instead of simply going through it, okay? Um, what else do sufferings do? Well, they turn us back to Christ's suffering for our salvation. They point us back. As both God and man, Jesus gathered up our cries of our sinful God forsakenness, sharing our common experience under the shadow of death. So Christ died our death, but he died our death as the ultimate sinner, okay? So, which means he also endured God's judgment for us, and by doing so bestowed eternal life on us mortal beings. That's part of the great exchange, right? So it's kind of like a swap meet. Okay, Jesus gets our sin, and we get his righteousness. That's a pretty good deal, right? Okay, let's look at the third bullet. What else does our suffering do? It points us forward to our resurrection, which can only take place because Christ rose from death, who will call us forth from our graves on the last day. So, is suffering the result of living in a sinful, fallen world? Yes. And yet, God takes that and uses it for his purposes. Now, let's, let's wrap our noodle around this. Does everybody suffer in this world, whether they're a Christian or not? Yeah. Doesn't everybody get sick? Doesn't everybody die? Doesn't everybody have calamity? I mean, so the things that really happen to us as fallen sinful beings living in a sin-corrupted world, they're all the same. The specifics may change. Or the intensity might change, but this reality doesn't. What's different for us is we know the ending of the story, right? I mean, if you're not a Christian and, I don't know, you have a nihilistic worldview, you would just go what? What's it say crap happens and then you die? Just kind of, right? Um, Yet what? Crap happens and then we live. Because what is death for the Christian? It's still death, we don't deny that. But death is the portal for eternal life. And it's just the beginning, because at first, until Christ returns, it's our soul in heaven. But that's still not the the whole enchilada, right? Whole enchilada is body and soul, okay? So no one enjoys suffering, though joy hides within suffering because we know how everything ends. In Acts, after Peter and the apostles left the Sanhedrin, so remember they they, they get called into the Council of Seventy and they they get whipped and boop, right? And as they leave, they rejoice because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. What? What are they, nut jobs? Right? So to rejoice from a beating seems strange, but they knew Jesus. They probably said, well, I don't know how God's going to turn this, but I know he's going to turn this for my eternal good, for the eternal good and his will for everyone. Wow. I think I would just be going, oh, that hurts. Oh. As opposed to, right, 
because that's usually what happens. Right? So, so when I'm walking through the house and I stub my toe, I don't praise Jesus. I usually say a bunch of bad stuff that would embarrass a pastor that just comes out of my mouth. Blah! And then Sherry's like, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so that's often our reaction, right? It's just, you know, kind of a, an instinctive, automatic sort of thing. And in fact, based on studies, they say if, you, if, you're, in, if you're in pain and you, and you yell a bunch of curse words, it actually helps alleviate the pain. <laughs> I'm not saying to do that. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, pastor, you're rationalizing when you stub your toe. I stub my toe a lot. And Sherry goes, oh, I haven't moved that. So Sherry has a lot of stuff in the house. I don't even know what half of it is. I'm like, I think I just live here. and That's it. Okay. So um, I hope she doesn't listen to this on YouTube. I am in trouble. Okay. Okay. So, um, so to the other apostles, they rejoiced and said to rejoice in your suffering. Okay. And so both James and Peter say as much. And Peter provides a little more insight. So let's listen to this from Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. Rejoice whenever you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. What? So that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are, so there's a connection to the resurrection there. Right? Christ's glory was revealed when he rose from death. It'll be revealed when we rise from death. But also in the sense that even when we're suffering, Right? we can kind of be a reflection of Christ. If you are insulted in connection with the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or a meddler. In other words, don't suffer because you're simply getting what you deserved in, within, the, within the realm of human justice. Oh, I'm suffering as a Christian. Why, because you hit that guy in the nose? You're getting beat up because you hit him in the nose, you idiot. Right? Okay. But if you suffer for being a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God in connection with his name. Okay. And so here's the link between suffering, joy, and comfort. I take these graphics and I turn the brightness up to 40. You can set it to whatever. And it's still really dark. Okay. So... Um, because Christ's suffering are flowing into the Christian, he is participating, that is, the Christian is participating in the sufferings of Christ because we're united to him. This isn't an intellectual understanding of this reality, but an actual spiritual participation. So when we suffer, right, Christ suffered for us, and that's done. And yet he's united to us, and he's suffering when we're suffering. And because of Christ, that connects back to the cross. So we're participating with Christ. Even though we're not actually there, he's actually suffering for our sin, right? And yet there is a connectedness to this, that our suffering is not in vain. That just as Christ suffered and God worked that for our salvation, our suffering because we're united to Christ, God will also turn and work it for our good. And if we don't understand, we will at the resurrection. Okay? All right. Suffering is a result of our fall into sin, but because Christ has taken suffering and worked it for our salvation, we know that in all things, including suffering, God works for the good of those who love him. And here's the Apostle Peter, later on in chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, 12, 13. Do not be surprised that a trial by fire has come to test you as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, rejoice, for you are participating in the sufferings of the Messiah so that you may also rejoice with great joy at the revelation of his glory. <clears throat> in other words, we are connected to his death. We are connected to his resurrection. And so all of our sufferings get wrapped up into Christ's sufferings for us on the cross, even though we're not technically there, but Christ is suffering that for us while we're going through it here. Well, I wish he could just take it all away, right? We still live in a fallen world. There is still sin, and there will still be suffering, okay? 
fact, a lot of the suffering is not just, oh, you know, something bad happened. Wouldn't we say that most of it in some way is stuff that we bring on ourselves? I mean, collectively? Yeah, but we still want to blame God for it. How could God let six million Jews die? What a loser of a God he is. Did we do that? Or did God do that? Well, <laughs> see, so we blame God for the stuff that we do as a fallen humanity, right? That's like, that's, here, so I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, Bear and, and uh, Julian's names in vain. Okay? So it's like they get mad and throw all their toys in the room and let it be. And then they leave and then they come back and they blame God for the toys on the floor. And a good parent will say, you need to clean up those toys. And you need to take the blame for that. Because you did it. All right? If not... You'll just have kids who grow up will blame everybody for the problems and they'll never learn to what? Adapt to the problems they face because they'll always be blaming others. Okay. Christians don't seek suffering, but suffering and crosses will come. Not if, will. It's unavoidable in this world. Everyone suffers in a fallen world, Christian and non-Christian. Christians, however, recognize Jesus came, died, and rose, and he is with you in your suffering. He suffered for you, and now he suffers with you. And as he suffered and rose, he will make sure you also rise to life. And all this is true, but it doesn't help if the, if the hot poker's in your eyeball, right? Yeah, so... Did you ever read of the martyrdom of Polycarp? Maybe, maybe I'm the only weirdo who does this stuff. It's worth reading. Just, you know, so because, you know, Christians were publicly martyred in the Roman stadium and there were Christians who were there and who wrote down what happened when he was martyred. So, okay. We're ready to press on with the next verse because that was all an excursus. Because when we read this, verse 24, we'll go, what? And then our heads explode. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Okay. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Okay, that's verse 26. Let's turn the page. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Okay, who's who here? The easiest one is, who are the saints? Yes. yes. Well, specifically the Christians in Colossae. But we could generalize this to say, okay, Paul's referring to Christians. Okay. So, um, so we know part of who's who here, okay? So Paul became a minister. So what does he mean by minister? That's a servant, okay? Diaconus, deacon, assistant, okay? Um, we could say pastor, okay? Apostle, I mean, these are all different terms, but he's really focusing on him being a servant. Okay, servant of whom? God. In other words, he doesn't, he's not authorized to do his own thing and do whatever he wants. He's somebody else's servant. And if you're somebody else's servant and you do, oh, I know, you say you're, uh, you clean the house for somebody, right? Well, yeah, you know. And the person you work for said, hey, you know, the toilets are pretty dirty. Can you really clean them up? You know, I don't want to clean toilets today. I'm just going to clean the windows. So what will the person, what will your boss probably do when he comes home and he sees the toilets are still dirty? Probably fire you, right? Because, well, you're paid to do certain things, right? And so in this sense, Paul is a minister. He's a servant and he's not authorized to do whatever he wants. He's authorized to do what God gives him to do, okay? That's the point with this word minister, became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. So, so what's the idea of a steward? Does a steward actually own the things he's managing? 
No. The whole point of a steward is that he doesn't own it, but he's managing something for another. Thus, stewardship is what? Faithfully using the stuff God has granted to us in our lives. It's not just putting money in the offering plate, right? No, stewardship is using everything God has blessed us with for his will and purposes. And sometimes we may not know what that is. Okay? Okay. So according to the stewardship, so Paul is a steward. What he's given to do is not his own thing. Well, you know, I don't really like this little, you know, this little part of the, I don't like this teaching about baptism. Really? God's going to use water? And he's going to, for, that sounds stupid. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I, I'm going to just talk about Jesus and the cross and not baptism. Is Paul authorized to do that? No. Because he's the servant. He's the steward of what God has given him. And he has to be faithful. Okay? So that was given to me for you. See the for you-ness? So in a sense, when a pastor preaches, it's for you. Now, the for you part doesn't mean, oh, well, if I don't like a sermon and it's boring, I'm going to go home. That's not the for you-ness. The for you-ness is what? That he's delivering the gospel goods, which are for you. Now, your perception of it may vary. It might be boring, or I don't like it, or, or whatever it is, okay? But the for you is not whether you like it, or it makes you feel good or happy. It's what? God's stuff for you okay and in a sense paul can't control one's response okay so it's given to me for you to make the word of god fully known ah so part of him being a steward is to make the word of god fully known we're going to see this stuff about knowing and knowledge and understanding and wisdom all kind of used okay and then verse 26 um The mystery hidden for ages. So he's making something known and he's saying that it's a mystery hidden for ages and generations, but revealed to his saints. Who or what is this mystery? Let let me make it a little easier. Who was not revealed to the world until he became incarnate? He's talking about Christ. Christ is the mystery, hidden in ages past because he hadn't yet become incarnate, now revealed to his saints. I mean, the saints believe in him. Okay? All that stuff. So, you know, remember Colossians has a whole bunch of strings of words. That's part of, um, there's different types of Greek. And Asiatic Greek in that area is kind of flowery. And so Paul is kind of using kind of the rhetorical flourish that's kind of used in that area. Even though in other areas um, where Greek was the common language, people kind of made fun of their use of Greek. Ah, they're just pretentious and using flowery terms and that sort of thing. So, all right. Are we ready to press on? Are you guys doing okay hanging in there? I don't know. All I see is a bunch of arms waving around. That's okay. Maybe a couple things are kind of like percolate in. Okay. Let's look at verse 27. Okay. Because we want to get to chapter 2 today. To them, who's the them? Oh, I don't know who the them is. The saints. To them, that is, God's saints, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Does that make sense? He was just talking about what? You know, sufferings and that sort of thing. In you, the hope of glory. So kind of the Christianity is a bunch of stuff, right? I mean, for us... It centers on and revolves around Jesus. So Christ for us, didn't Paul just kind of run with that? Right? And then Christ for us, Christ in us. The for becomes the end. 
So every time we come to church, we get more Jesus for us. So we get more Jesus in us. Why do I need that? I got a smidgen of Jesus when I was baptized when I was a baby. Why do I need anything else? See? Can you have too much of Jesus? Well, no. There it is. Okay. All right. So, um, kind of interesting that you see this whole kind of four in connectedness. Okay. So, let me see if I wrote any crazy questions. So, what did God choose to make known? That's, of course, Jesus. What are the implications of this? Well, right? The forest is in us, we're saved. Okay. And then let's look at verses 20 and 20. Him, who is the him? Christ, Jesus, him we proclaim. Now the we here is Paul and Timothy. Paul, he's, that's the, it's, it's the we. It's not a royal we. And he's not including the congregation at this point because he's going to admonish them in a couple words, which lets you know the we is not including them. Okay, so to be a good reader, you have to go, well, does that include the, right? Not to say that the we can't do this, but here it does not. Okay, him, we, that is Paul and Timothy, proclaim warning everyone, meaning you, but we're being polite, right? So this is a roundabout way of saying warning you and teaching you, but everyone. So this is more palatable with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Okay? For this I toil. This is the word for agony or agonize. So Paul is really serious to say, you know, he, whatever happens, he's not going to quit doing this if he is, if he is able not to quit. Okay? For this I toil, struggling with all his, whose, who's the his? Well, his, this would be Christ's. And so let's make it a, right, a, a possessive. Struggling with all Christ's energy that he powerfully works within me. Okay? Wow. A lot of stuff going on there, okay? So what are all of this is for? So in their proclamation of Christ, what two things are the Apostle Paul and pastors are they doing? Warning, that's the word for admonishing. Okay, so in other words, he's what? Correcting them where they may be, where they may be off. And this is really what? Um, and so this is the word, um, so new to te oh, right? So this is the word new is kind of like the word for mind, from noose. So you can kind of see that mind connection in there, right? So it deals with straightening out muddled or immature thinking, which is, the meaning that Paul intends because what does he say after admonishing for their immature thinking, which is in the, which is in the meaning, right? Admonishing everyone, admonishing you for your immature thinking that we may present everyone mature, not immature, but mature. Well, childlike in faith, but we don't remain childish. Eh? And so Paul wants Christians to mature. What does that mean? Well, Paul gets really in-depth in Ephesians using that exact same word. The word for mature is teleos. So you may understand this in a different form when Christ says it is finished. It is telestai. Same root word. It is completed. It is matured. Yeah, that would be a little odd. But really, it's, it is completed more than it is finished. It's not something that had happened and now it's over. But what he came to do, he completed in his death. Okay? So that's the same. So God, so he wants to present us as complete Christians. Oh, when does that happen? The resurrection. So this isn't just, oh, well, you need to mature in the faith and quit being a baby. Right? Well, okay. But this is all toward what end? What? Being complete 
in Christ on the last day. So here's Ephesians 4, 1 through 11. Let's just take a quick look at that. Now this is a translation graphic format because our translations butcher this really bad. Uh, and, but if you look at this picture, who is the only person doing something? If you look at this graphic. Own, Jesus is the only one. Which is the point. So Paul's point in Ephesians 4 is, what is Jesus doing for his church? Okay? Not, and normally we will hear this translated as what? Jesus gave to his church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. What? To build up the body of Christ. So the way that it's translated is this is what Jesus does, and now the pastor's got to get off their tuchus, their rear ends, and they need to do something, and then the lay people need to do something and get off their butts, because that, and we could say, oh, there's, yeah, we, we are to do stuff in Christ church. But the point Paul is making here is what is Jesus doing? And there's only one verb in this entire, entire verse. And the others are nouns, and how do you translate some of these nouns is what makes it really hard. So Jesus gave to his church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He uses the definite article, the pastor and teachers, meaning it's one idea. Pastor, teachers, why? Toward the equipment of the saints. That's why it's translated as to equip the saints. But equip is a verb, because that's a noun in the Greek. Toward the equipment of the saints for ministry work, for the building of Christ's body, and building is a noun. For what purpose? To arrive in unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son into a mature, complete man, into the measure and maturity of Christ's fullness. No longer infants tossed by the waves and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and the craftiness of deceitful schemes. Oh. Okay, so Colossians, what is, what is the whole point? That so that what? People so that the people will die in faith, trusting in Christ, arise into the completeness Christ gives them. That's the point. Okay? In that, yeah, you need to mature, you need to know more doctrine, you need to, yeah, all that's in there. But Paul is leaping to the end. Admonishing, teaching, okay, that we may present everyone mature. He's saying we, but it's really Christ through pastors, Pastor Timothy and Apostle Paul. Okay? Does that make sense? This is all toward that end. So, this graphic didn't turn out too bad. Okay. Um, so let's, now we're gonna flip to chapter two, cause yay, we're in chapter two. So, and now Paul is going to apply basically what he just taught. How does this apply to the life of a Christian? So let's, let's look at verses one through three. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. Again, that's the struggle is a word for agonize. Okay, I have for you and for those at Laodicea. Remember, Laodicea is not too far removed from where Colossae is. Okay, so they're in a walking distance. It'd be a good walk though. Okay, not like getting in the car and ching, there you are. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Remember, did Paul ever travel to Colossae? Eh. So, who does he know the best in the congregation? Or whom does he know the best? The pastor, Epaphras. And Epaphras became a Christian in Paul's third missionary journey and he helped start the congregation at Colossae. Okay, so it was Epaphras who contacted Paul. Help, I don't know what to do. Okay, so who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts, okay, so hearts we think of as a seat of emotion, but really heart is more the seat of one's essence or being. Okay, uh, to read blah, 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 their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom, of wisdom and knowledge. Whole long of strings, flowery Asiatic Greek. Okay, and yet we can kind of see who is the main focus of, of whom or what Paul is referring to. Jesus. 
right? Full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is, or who is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, meaning Christ has what? All the goods, right? Wisdom and knowledge, yeah, okay? And so, a couple things to, to uh, so questions, why is Paul struggling for the saints of Colossae and Laodicea? Because he wants to make sure that what? They receive Christ, and they mature uh, into full, you know, that they rise into completeness on the last day. Being knit together in love, well, okay, that could be the meaning. But here he uses the term sumbibadzo, which also can mean teach. And it just makes sense that teach really fits the context better. So I'm going to say, even though knit together is really more of a common usage, it's not. So I would say, they should, I would have translated this as being taught in love. Okay? So because that kind of fits, right? Why you're taught in love, why? To reach the full assurance of understanding and knowledge. See, so yeah, there is unity, but here's Paul talking about teach, teaching them. And it says a passive voice, meaning Christ is really teaching them through him or through Epaphras, okay? So Paul is being wordy. He's using that fancy Asiatic Greek, right? But what does he mean by the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery? All of this is fancy wording to refer to whom? Jesus. See, so, so if we were like, okay, if he had a modern day editor, we would take all, psh, and just write Christ, right? So, and that's how we would do that. But you would, we'd miss out on all that flowery language and in a sense, of kind of a deeper and broader understanding of, of who Christ is. Kind of, it's interesting, the use of mystery, isn't it? So, because mystery is stuff that if God did not choose to reveal it, would we know it? No. So that's also in there. And, you know, there's some linkages back to Daniel. I didn't choose to kind of bring that out because then the lesson would be two hours instead of an hour. But, um, but mystery. Here's, here's a little tidbit for you. So when the Bible gets translated into Latin, well, we'll say Jerome's version because there were earlier Latin versions, but Jerome really is the one who, he, he does the King James version for Latin is what he does. He comes up with a standard version, and it's still the standard Latin version today, right? And so, mystery is the word sacramentum. What does that sound like? Sacrament. And so, the church adopted the word sacrament, even though that specific word, well, when the word mystery is being used, yeah. So, because it's a mystery. We don't understand how Christ's body and blood could be in bread and wine. It's a mystery, hence the term sacramentum. This was before the whole transubstantiation thing like caught fire and based on medieval sciences and stuff, Rome, never mind. I don't even want to go there. Okay, so, but yeah. So the issue we have with transubstantiation is, we, you can hold it as a, as a pious opinion, but don't teach it as doctrine because it's not in scripture, okay? And it's really how does bread and wine become Christ's body and blood? We go, because Jesus says it is. So we go, back to the, we go back to the first grade kid in Sunday school. And what's the answer? Jesus? Yes, Timmy, you're right. So whenever you don't know, whenever you don't know an answer in Sunday school, guess Jesus, and there's a 50% chance you'll be right. So, okay. So, um, yeah. So now we're going to find out, oh, well, what's the, what's the problem? We're now going to get a little hint of why Paul was compelled to write the letter of Colossians. And it's this one little verse. He mentions a couple little things that are happening. So we do not want to close our eyes on this one and blink because we'll miss it. So let's look at verse 4. I say this, what's the this? All the stuff. The wisdom and knowledge, the mystery, all pointing to Christ, that He is for us and we are, and that makes us in Him and He in us. All of this. I say all this. 
me to say all these things, I suppose. Okay. Um, in order that, so that, no one may delude you. So this is kind of the idea of, of kind of use rhetoric, use trickery of language. Okay? So one may delude you with plausible arguments. So in other words, what these false teachers are doing, they're well-skilled in language, and they're coming up with arguments that when you just listen to it and don't ponder them too much, you go, yeah, yeah. So, and it's easy to get snookered. So I remember at seminary, um, there was this, I don't know, you know, they have these like big giant brainos that get together and discuss stuff way smarter than me and well better in the languages. And so, and you have somebody saying, well, this particular passage means this, and he explains why. And somebody else goes, this particular passage means something else, and here's why. And so as we're listening, it's like the tennis game, right? We're getting our heads going like ding, ding, back and forth. And so when one guy is done, we're like, yeah, he's right. And then the next guy, oh, he's right. And then back and forth. Because we didn't know, we knew enough to understand what was being said and make sense of it, but we didn't know enough to actually say, who is actually right? We were like, ding, 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 right? That's these guys. These guys come along and, yeah, see? So they need, they need to know more of Christ. So that way they're not deluded by what these false teachers are saying. That's really kind of the point, okay? So that's what's happening. We still don't know specifically what these arguments are, but it's kind of clear that, it, that there's a works righteousness involved because Paul at a number of points basically is very clear that their status before God has nothing to do with them or what they've done. Very clear on that. So he's kind of, He's kind of taking, you know, he's kind of sweeping all that debris away to, to ensure that the gospel is shining forth. Okay? And are we ready for verse 5? And I was ready 30 minutes ago, Pastor. For though I am absent in body, he's not there. He's in prison. He couldn't be there if he wanted to. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit. That could be a big S. Could be a little S. Rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So even though there are these people who kind of crept in, who are starting to snooker the Christians at Colossae, why is Paul still encouraged? Why does he still have hope concerning the Christians there? Because they have a good foundation. See? And so that, you know. So you always go, hmm. And so... Remember that one passage we went over when, from Ephesians chapter 4? Let's, let's turn the page. Here's kind of a litmus, wherever the lesson is. Okay, I don't know where I put it. Anyways, so here's the, here's the litmus test, okay? Is, is it talking about Jesus and what he does for us, or is it about us? See, the traditional translation, which is horrid, I could understand why, because how do you translate some of these words as verbs, as nouns, when they're only verbs in our language? But still, it's all about what? Not what Jesus is doing. Jesus gave. But what pastors need to do so the parishioners can do their things to build up the church. And the whole point of Ephesians is this is what Jesus is doing. See? And so the whole point here is these guys, who's doing what? And Paul is always going back to Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus, right? So it's like Jesus saved you. Yeah, but I got to believe, right? And so it's that, that but. Of course you have to believe. But, right? Does believing itself save you? No. You believe because Jesus saves you. See, believe is a result of what God does. Believing does not cause that. I know that's convoluted, like, what? Right? But, yeah, so, you know, we can even take belief and turn, take it away from God and make it ours. Of course we believe, right? 
but we believe by God's working in us. And that's, that, that's kind of the point that Paul will make. Okay? So wherever I put the lesson, wherever I put, here it is. Okay, so let's turn to page, okay? Because here. Okay? So this is Paul's rhetorical emphasis through chiasm. Like, Pastor, you are chiasm obsessed. So chiasm is what? It's a way to stay, say something, and then say it in reverse order, and in the middle, most of the time is the main point. And so you can have a couple things going on. And this isn't weird because this was an accepted rhetorical form of the day. Not for us, so we look look at it and we're like, this is weirdness. But if this is part of your woof and warp and your thinking and what you learn in school, then this almost comes naturally to you. You go, oh, I see a chiasm coming on. Yeah, it's there, right? And so you can kind of see, A, I rejoice for your sake and in my flesh. That's the word sarx, because look at A prime at the bottom. Though absent in body, that's the same Greek word sarx. Though absent in flesh, I am rejoicing. B, make known the riches of this mystery, meaning Christ. B prime, the riches of the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. C, for this I toil, struggling. C prime, how great a struggle I have for you. D, with all his, God's energy. And then what did he say immediately after that? That he, God, powerfully works. So what's the point? When Paul was using himself in the sense as an example, he's saying his apostolic ministry is only possible by God's working okay what's the point for those in Colossae God's working for them through Christ because look look at um look at B and B prime that's referring to Christ so it's God's doing through Christ okay so that's kind of rhetorically the point these guys they're snookering you with their fancy words and their plausible arguments but It's taking you away from God and what he does for you through Christ. Be forewarned. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Oh, no. Be better to play video games. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Uh, mm. Well, a lot of it's worldview. So a lot of Christianity operates, well, God has saved you, now what are you going to do? And yet, Scripture talks about God saving you in the past, God saving you in the present, and God saving you in the future. That is at the resurrection on the last day. So salvation is a done deal and yet not yet fully complete, which is Paul is saying, so that you will what? be presented complete, okay? So we need to understand salvation that way, which is why we come to church. Why you come to church? To get saved. Well, you're already saved. Can I have too much salvation? That's what Jesus set up. What he told pastors do all deal with salvation. Preaching, teaching, administering the sacraments, baptism, absolution, those tasks are what? Bringing Christ to you. So he is in you. Okay? And if I do otherwise, kick me out on the street. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, Paul is a crazy dude sometimes because he's just like, his head's way too big. He's so smart and we could barely keep up. We ask that you give us patience as we deal with what he has written, that we follow the ebb and flow and the rhetorical flourishes, flourishes he makes, especially in the book of Colossians where he's all over the map. May, may we be granted this so we can understand our life with you because of Christ in the spirit that you sent. May this delight us all our days so we may remain steadfast and secure until Christ calls us home into eternity. In whose name we pray, amen.